Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Lori Jensen, and I'm the Director of Public Relations for Wilmington University, but I'm here today in my role as President of the Public Relations Society of Delaware. Um, I'm the current president, and we need to have a talk, this time surrounding how to talk with people. Sounds a little strange, I'm sure, but if you notice and you look around, people are having some difficulty with that, especially in this supercharged political atmosphere with racial tensions the way they are. And we decided that some friends of mine should get together and have a conversation. We invite you to join us. My career includes senior communications positions for Fortune 500 and Fortune 300 corporations in technology and science, but most of all, public relations, and that's about talking with people. There's also three other people in this room that have similar backgrounds, but very, very different outcomes. Eugene Young is a 2004 graduate and Division I basketball player for UMBC, the University of Maryland at Baltimore. He's the co-founder and, co and board chairman of Delaware Elite, which is a nonprofit dedicated to helping student athletes through education, leadership, and character development. You may not know, but Eugene Young was Senator Cory Booker's legislative aide in the Senate from 2013 to 2015, but you may know him better as a man who ran for mayor against our current mayor, Mike Przicki, in 2016. Eugene created or co-created Network Delaware in 2016. It's a community empowerment organization that leverages research, analysis, and leadership development for lasting socioeconomic change in our town. And he's the founding curator for the Wilmington Hub of the World Economic Global Shapers Program, helping to bring global thought levels to our local community. He's also the CEO and president of the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, where he's about the business of training Wilmington's future leaders, and he organizes and advocates for the entire community. We also have with us today Leon Tucker. He's the owner of Leon Tucker Rela uh, Public Relations and the past president of PRSA Delaware, my colleague. He served as director of communications for the Department of Labor in Delaware, and he's prior to that served in the same role for Habitat for Humanity in Delaware. He's a trained journalist. He was writer for the Miami Herald, the Boston Globe, and here in Wilmington, the News Journal. He's taught journalism as well at the Delaware State University, and he's also was appointed to the Newcastle County Government Diversity Commission. And certainly, our host, Ivan Thomas for DETV, as the owner of DETV, he's allowed us a studio. He's the executive director of Comcast Public, Public Access Channel 28 here in Wilmington. And he's the owner of Blue Films Media. He brings video to life for numerous clients throughout Delaware while using his content creation to enlighten and engage a variety of audiences. And he teaches positive media and film at Kumba Academy. It's, it's a city charter school here in Wilmington. And he closes that achievement gap for kids in creativity and scholarship. Um, he's also a leader committed to causes that include sitting on the digital advisory uh, Digital Media Advisory Board for Del Castle and Will, uh, William Penn High Schools. He's mostly focused on building relationships and promoting communication with diverse groups throughout the community, and most recently throughout the discord that happened in Wilmington during the riots. There was a time in public relations when the question, how should a company or a nonprofit engage when there are issues that are polarizing people. That means everybody's taking a side, nobody's finding common ground, nobody's having a dialogue. Instead, it's one-sided all the time. And most of the, most of the time, the answers we would get as public relations practitioners was, don't touch the issue. Stick to your brand, stick to your message, and just wait for everything to go away. Then we moved into a time when the advice might be for an organization to just go dark. Close up shop, pull all your advertising, stop the social media until everything's been resolved or replaced with the next big thing. And then you can resume business as usual. Today, it looks like we have companies and organizations that are wanting to side, wanting to speak out, and align themselves with one side or the other 
on issues ranging from health and safety during this COVID-19 epidemic to social justice issues and race relations. There's a survey of American consumers that happened in 2019 that showed that 71% of people think it's important for businesses to support social movements. And people actually expect businesses to lean into the controversy now and take unwavering stances on issues that are related to the environment, human rights, gender, and politics. Of course, we've seen some missteps when that happens. I don't know if you remember, but there was a, an entire commercial with um, Kendall Jenner, and it was for Pepsi, and she broke ranks and went up to a policeman with a can of Pepsi. That bombed. That was massive backlash. It was accused of appropriating a movement and using it for the gain of the brand of Pepsi. And it came under fire and led to massive public apology. Now, with all of that in mind, let me ask you gentlemen, I'll start with you, Eugene. What are you seeing today when it comes to organizations that are communicating about the current issues? Are there any right now that are surprising to you? Um, I don't think any, it's, it's interesting because my answer 30 days ago would be different than the answer 90 days ago, which would be different than the answer 150 days ago. Um, our, what is going on within our country, the, 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 the pivots and changes that have gone on within our communities have, has just happened at such a rapid pace. Um, and so there are companies or organizations um, that I would have assumed would have taken the original stance which you mentioned earlier about going dark, um, not doing anything, staying quiet, um, but what we're starting to see is that there's community, there's people that are saying, you have an obligation, or rather, you better say something. Um, you have to get in the game, in a sense. Um, you have to talk about what's going on. We will no longer accept um, people st sitting on the sidelines. And that is something that we're starting to see more and more. And so I'm seeing more companies, more organizations, more people actually talking about what's going on open for dialogue about what's going on now than if you told me six, seven months ago, um, would, people, would so many people be engaged and involved? Um, but I think the compounding effects of everything from the COVID-19, everything to uh, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Floyd, Ms. like so all these things have come together um, and they've shed a spotlight on issues that people can no longer um, shy away from. And so um, I think it's good that companies and individuals and organizations are taking a step in and starting to deal with these issues. But I, I am looking personally for um, more, I want to see how sub substantive it is over the long haul. Um, and so make sure that it's more than just appeasement or lip service, but um, action and actualizing what is going on um, and actualizing rather solutions um, and moving forward. So you're working from a nonprofit aspect, correct? Indeed, indeed. indeed. Leon, you have business experience on the other side, in the for-profit sector. What do you think of that? Well, um, the situation we're in right now, uh, and Eugene is right, it really boils down to the long haul. In the past, we, we've been here before uh, with uh, situations with social injustice and uh, police brutality against people of color. Um, but this is way different. And what it has done in the, in the long run it has forced uh, companies that uh, heavily benefit from the very people who have been disenfranchised uh, uh, throughout the history of this country. It has forced them to uh, to really think about what their role is in this and uh, how they're benefiting from uh, the commerce and uh, the business that uh, people of color, black people in particular, are, 
um, are, are making uh, uh, possible for them. So when the movement uh, really got started, um, corporations, they really had to look within themselves and, 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 and make some decisions about how does this impact us as, as a company and, and as a community, uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, in the role that they have in the community? And the end result is, is it really boils down to uh, them taking action for the sake of, of being relevant, being a part of the solution, uh, because they do realize that um, they are part of the problem, particularly when you have a corporation that has very little representation of people of color, or black people in particular, uh, in leadership positions. So this goes beyond the streets for for profits and for businesses, because it's forced them to look within themselves, within their organizations, within their companies, and to make some tough decisions about what are they going to do moving forward uh, to help turn the tide in this country when it comes to uh, equality uh, from from the, from the from the from the corner in the streets to the boardroom. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I say all that to say that this is a very very important time. Uh, for corporate America and for uh, for-profit businesses because this is going to change the face of how we do business in this country. It's going to change the face of how we interact with one another, and it's going to change the face of how black people in this country are treated, finally. Ivan, are we moving fast enough, or are we moving too fast and risking backlash? That's a good question. It took us a very long time to get here, and I believe it's going to take just as long to, to get where we want to be. I think right now we're in a position and we're in a place that people are still trying to figure it out. I see a lot of, I see a lot of companies uh, folding, um, not just, and a lot of it has to do with messaging right now. Um, I see uh, another part is, you know, other things. But when you look at this summer, the summer has been hell, like literally hell. One after another incident happened. And what this incident has shown us and will show us, and especially in media, that companies need to start talking and speaking with empathy in this time. That's a very, very important, and you mentioned earlier uh, Pepsi. That wasn't, that wasn't empathetic at all. And people saw right past that. Right. And then now think of the recovery that Pepsi had to do, the damage control, and the shrapnel, removing the shrapnel afterwards. And in this time right now, the first event that, that comes is COVID-19. And then we have the death of, of numerous amount of black people. And companies are now, they don't know how to, to answer, they don't know what to say, and they're trying to figure it out. So I think that right now it's really going to take some soul searching. It's going to take speaking across the aisle with, with our white brothers and sisters and, and forming allies to figure out what is the problem. What have you been through? How do we, how do we find the human again? Or, if, or how do we just find the human in us? And how do we message it without you know, causing any, any more turmoil? And I think that, and this is just my personal my view, because I'm in media every day, just like everyone else is, is that we actually need to have not just a conversation, but dinner, coffee, and talk about our differences. And then let's get together and make change. So I don't think, I, I think it's just going to take a little bit more time and a little bit more heart and a little bit more understanding while we're moving. You mentioned something interesting in your, in your response. You said, we're all in media. Never in history has it ever been more true mm -hmm. because every person today who has a cell phone basically is a citizen journalist if they yeah. want to be. Yeah. 
or they're just a social media gadfly, if you will. Mm -hmm. So is there really an option for silence? Is there really an option for pausing and thinking? Or is the messaging now so COVID-related or so race relations related <laughs> that they're stumbling over themselves and they don't know what to do? When, when what I've learned is silence is a response. And right now, you can, you can, you can see the heart and soul of a company on, and their morals and their grounds and, and, and be, of how they're responding. And you can duck like, if they could duck like a turtle, put their, they go back into their shell, but I promise you they won't be around. Because what people want right now is answers. So when you look at companies that don't have a diverse board or they don't have, you know, all different people at the table to say, hey, you can't do that or you can't say that or you can't, that's where the problem, that's one of the problems where, where it lies. Um, I think this is a time, and, 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 I, and I say this wholeheartedly, that we all need to speak up. We all might not protest. But we all can speak up and say, hey, this hurts, this is wrong, how do we move forward? And have a legitimate, grown-up conversation so we can move forward. Gene, they don't teach civics very much in the public schools anymore, do they? Do you usually? Uh, I, I think it's um, touch and go, kind of based some, some do, some do, don't. Um, I think that one of the things that we have to do is make sure people are very much educated on um, the issues. Um, educated in knowing um, how to advocate for oneself, one's family, and their community. Um, and, you know, I, I, I give this, I would give this example fairly often of how um, during my, my campaign, I remember um, vividly how I would knock on doors and I would have many families say, you know, I would ask, what's your prime issue? And many families would say, education. Um, but uh, education is not something that's legally um, controlled by the mayor of the city of Wilmington. Um, and so I think just that in itself um, can open up Pandora's box because what does that mean? That means that you have many people that may be upset with um, an issue, with what's going on, what's directly impacting their family, but because they don't know who specifically to go to, um, their anger um, and their frustration and it cannot be pointed at a specific entity that's going to fix their problem. Rather, it goes somewhere where it's, it's displaced to another area where it doesn't necessarily, the answer cannot be solved. So I think it's important on a variety of areas that we, one, we make sure people are educated about how they can connect with their legislator, their school board member, their community leaders about what's going on, letting people know that they have a voice and that they should um, come out, they should be heard, um, and that now is the time for that. Um, also letting people know that, you know, there's no cavalry coming, you are the leader. Um, too often, we wait and we say, you know what, well, this person's going to be speaking for you or that person's going to be speaking for you. No one can give a more authentic voice to an issue rather than the people that are in that issue at that moment. And we need to, um, you know, many people need to take a step back um, and we need to make sure other people are taking a step forward. Um, to be able to discuss and bring up these issues that are going on within our community. And we need to open our ears and shut our mouths so that we can actually take, um, take what's coming in um, and not be quick to respond back, but actually listen to people. And I think that needs to be done at all levels, whether it be at the local community, city, county, state. I think there needs to be a lot more hearing of what's going on. Um, and then being able to find solutions to meet the needs that are going on within the community. So it's about listening, and it's also about action. Because if you listen, there's no action. It just does us no good because people already have the the feeling, the this long-standing belief that you know they're not being heard anyway. 
So if you really want to make change, it's about the education, educating piece, it's about the, the listening piece, um, and it's about getting out of, in many cases, getting out of people's damn way in order to allow them to, um, to be able to advocate for themselves in their community um, and, and, and help along when, when needed. But when you're dealing with what we call civil discourse, Active listening, absolutely, because you know you don't want to be sitting there trying to figure out an answer mm -hmm. until the entire statement from the other person. But mm -hmm. frustration comes when you don't know who you're talking to, you don't know who to talk to. Yes. But more importantly, where does respect come in, mm -hmm. Leon? Do you have a like? Where does this respect get taught? Where where can people draw from the well? and come up with not just the ability to hear, but the ability to also state a case without causing more strife? Well, the first thing that, that everybody needs to do is to recognize that the problem exists. Um, there are no, there's no way about, around it. Um, and I think part of the problem is a lot of folks who are reacting to what's going on today aren't really looking at the fact that this is a real problem in this country, and it's not a new problem. So the first thing we all need to do is to recognize that the problem exists mm -hmm. and in our own way come to grips with what we understand and what we don't understand and be honest about those things. That is where you start to develop a admiration, if you will, for, uh, for what's happening. Uh, and I'm talking about white people and black people, because there are, there are some people of color who they just, they don't get it. But the first thing that we need to do is recognize there's a problem. The second thing, uh, and it harkens to your question about, you know, where do, you, where do we go now? Who do you, who do you talk to? Uh, is not being afraid to, uh, uh, to ask the tough questions, uh, to reach out and to admit that, you know, I don't understand what's happening here, but I also want to understand what my role is and what I can do to address the issue. Uh, so from for the, for the question about, you know, what, where, where does the res respect come in? I think it is more about s sympathizing with the people who have been experiencing this for what it is, which is atrocious. Uh, it is disheartening, it's scary. Uh, and beyond that, finding out from those people that you can, you talk to about it, uh, what, role, what role can you play to make it to make it better. And depending on where you are in the equation, you could be a business owner, be a private citizen. You could be someone who is uh, in, a, in a high community position of leadership. Um, everybody has a different role to play in this and understanding that A, there's a problem, B, that we have, I have a role and a responsibility to address it, and then having the courage to take the necessary steps to take us to the next level. But if you're a business, let's say, you know, just a, a mom and pop to a large corporation, there's a push me, pull you kind of tension that goes on because you have a disease that's ruling people right now. You have a growing discontent that's causing some problems. You have racial inequality. You have people that have been in isolation who come out and they're, it's almost like learning to drive again. It's learning to get along with everybody in your neighborhood again because mm -hmm. it's just been your peeps. That's it. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that civility again where you can sit down and, and take into consideration everything that's on the TV, everything that's going on, and still calm that neighbor that's spewing opinions without 
and that could be a corporate neighbor, that could be uh, a, a community neighbor, it could be a nonprofit, it could be anybody, anybody or anything. At what point can we draw from the well for people to understand that civility is going to be pushed under the carpet for a while, it has been, how do we bring it back? Well, I mean, the civility is there. I mean, let's not, let's not confuse social unrest and rioting with, with, let's not confuse civility and rioting. Um, and I think pro part of the problem is people try to mix the folks who are out there protesting and trying to get their voices heard, they equate that with or expect there to be rioting. Uh, anybody who wants justice, anybody who wants social justice, that's a, that's a civil and noble request that should not be confused with discourse. Right. Uh, and that's a, that's a problem that we have to have to really contend with because it's, it's confusing. I mean, it really is confusing people who want to get it, but I believe they're afraid to kind of step outside to try to figure out where their, what their role is because they don't want to be lumped into the group or the narrative that, you know, this is, uh, if, I get, if I'm a part of this movement, then that means that I'm a part of all the negative things that come come about. If you take the riot in a way, if you take, you know, the the vitriol that comes along with um, really orchestrated attempts, if you ask me, to to uh, disparage uh, this very noble movement, if you take all that away, you have civility. You have a group of people who really want change that is going to benefit this world. It's going to benefit this country. So, you know, for us to to ask the question, where do, where does the civility has always been there, and it's not going to go anywhere. We just have to be realistic about what the issue is, and have high expectations that uh, as we move forward, we will be more comfortable with having these conversations. We will be more comfortable with going together, trying to find that, not common ground, but the level ground, where we all can stand equally. In thinking about what you just said, the civil aspect of things has always been there. I'm thinking of Colin Kaepernick. And when you take a knee, to me that is part of the civil discourse. That was you know, along the lines of Dr. King, Mahatma Gandhi, all those people that said civil disobedience is the same as civil discourse, essentially. I'd like to come back to that more and more as you think about your responses and the next questions that I ask, because it wasn't enough, was it, to take a knee? Instead, football player doesn't play ball for a couple years. So that's an inequality that's just been dumped on and on and on. If you were to take a look at that today, it's not going to be the same. And now he's being actively pursued for another position. So those who riot in the streets to try to make change let's say they decide to take the different tactic, we need to take a look at that and find out how to translate the action into the better words so that people can begin to understand each other. Ivan, you were on the street. Did you see people talking? No. What I would, I was out there um, early part of, the, early part of the, the rioting and what I saw, what I saw out there was, um, I saw a lot of opportunists. Um, I saw, I didn't see protesters. 
I saw people at first wanting to be heard and then it evolved and grew into just anger. As a, as a black man, I understand what, what that anger looks like. Um, I had a conversation with uh, a couple of my neighbors, um, my white neighbors, and awesome, awesome, awesome people, awesome, just awesome, I like to call them family, awesome family. And they were asking me about that night, and they were asking me, okay, what's it like growing up black? You know, we we're having an uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I'm like, I remember at 16 getting pulled out the car, like on a back road, and repeatedly screamed at at gunpoint, where the drugs at? And my friend and I are looking at each other with tears in our eyes, like, we're not going home. And at 16 years old, it was, and, and, and 45 right now, and still remembering that. And then growing up, and two year, a year later being thrown in a paddy wagon over something, you know, you, you tend, we, this, this routine is always in, in, in the lives of, of us growing up. So I understood what that anger looked like that night on, on the street, but then it evolved. And it wasn't anger. It was something totally, something else that was throughout nationwide. Um, Martin Luther King said, they said, rioting is the voice of the unheard. And it is. You know, it, it, it was a scary, it was scary out there that, that night. It was. Um, but you saw a lot. You saw a lot of people. You saw some people just, hey, we don't have we don't have what they have, you know. I, I did hear someone out there said, you know, they're like, yes, why are you burning down? The, why are you breaking in the stores? They're like, because it's not ours. It still didn't make no sense to me, you know. But and then you run down there that night. I, I ran across Eugene, and I'm like, Eugene, you good? What are you doing? And he's like, I'm out here for the kids. I'm out here. He was literally taking kids that were 10 years, seven years, because they were there and just seeing him just like, all right, come on, go home, go home, in the middle of all this turmoil. It was, I, I never been, I've been to a ride before down North Carolina that was different. I wasn't here for the riots uh, uh, prior and uh, 50 years ago, um, but that riot, that, that right there, it showed me the changes that we have to make wholeheartedly with everyone from from my white brothers and sisters to our black and, and our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters that we need not just talk but attempt to make change to attempt to understand um, I remember I, I ran across an older gentleman and he said, this is not like when I was growing up. This is a time right now that we as people can listen to one another. And now we have more allies to make and create change. And it was so powerful when he said that. And I think that conversations like this, like what, like what we're doing now, is to, un to understand people is a great way, not just to start, but to, to, to make it happen. Let's take a break and we'll be back. I'm Tabina Aries, Christina Cultural Arts Center's School of the Arts Program Manager. CCAC offers fall and winter spring class sessions, which can be viewed on our customer portal. Just visit our website at ccacde.org. Be sure to stop in during our art loop on first Fridays for a happy hour networking mixers. Christina Cultural Arts Center, we're here for you. Second Chances Farm is kicking off today, an ambitious program to tackle childhood obesity and food deserts all at the same time. Our next door neighbor is Eastside Charter, and we plan on Friday, March 20th, to kick off a 12-week program. We will deliver 200 community-supported agriculture, CSA packages, of six different crops we grow here at 3030 Bower Street. 
to 200 children and their families at Eastside Charter. Each one of those packages will contain six different things that are nutritious and we'll rotate what is in there and we'll have recipes and menus on how you can use this lovely food. Each package costs $20 a week. For 12 weeks is $240. And if you would like to support it, please go to our website, www.second, S-E-C-O-N-D, chances, C-H-A-N-C-E-S, farm.com. And there's a place where you can support uh, our community supported agriculture, our CSA program. It's one way for $20 a week, you can make an impact on childhood obesity and food deserts in Wilmington. Hi, I'm Andre Jones, a drama teacher at Christina Cultural Arts Center. I teach acting through narrative design. <laughs> what is that you say? <laughs> well, it's learning how to be while imagining and writing it down. Essentially, uh, experimenting with writing and acting simultaneously. The better you write, the richer the scene. The better you act, the better you can be. Be bold, be brilliant, be uh, original, be imaginative, be generous in giving, but whatever you do, be. Because if you don't be, who do? Come, be with us. Christina Cultural Arts. Inspire greatness. Thanks for joining us. We're talking about civil discourse and how we can get back to it, in Wilmington especially. I think what we've come up to at this point is, Ivan, you're a storyteller with a camera. Um, Eugene, you've got stories galore just from helping the kids that you do and trying to set direction. Leon, you've been a story writer for how many years? And it doesn't matter if you're in private business or in, in journalism. But what I hear you saying then is stories are a way to get back to the table. And it's funny you mention that. Just to start us off, I had a conversation with a young woman over Facebook during the night of the riots in, on Market Street. And she kept telling me there's no way that I could possibly understand what she's been through, what others that are out rioting were going through. And I agreed with that. But that I couldn't understand the discrimination well yeah I can my mother was a white woman no mistaking it but when she was in the Sun she tanned about as dark as Eugene and my brother did the same and we went to visit my grandparents in Clearwater Florida and my mother got on the airplane and sat me as a towhead baby bright blonde baby with blue eyes on her very tanned lap and my brother sat to her side, and she was treated with all of the disrespect of every other black person on that airplane. It was TWA, and when my, when my mother got back and explained what happened to my grandfather, there was a lawsuit for that discrimination. And my mother was considered a black woman, and she was treated terribly by every person on that airplane. What were they going to do? Save me and put her out? That was ridiculous. But it's a story. And from that story, I started to try to build some communication with a young woman who was in the thick of things. Ivan, you were there last night, at that time, that night. And when I saw you with the camera on the street, you were telling people stories. And yeah, there was a lot of discord there, but where can we take it from? the storyteller's point of view. And I'd love to hear from both Eugene and, and Leon on this too. But why don't you start it off? The Bible is written in allegory and symbolism. The art of storytelling it is the way that we've learned for, 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 for decades, for centuries. And when I realize how powerful media is, that's how we see things. I see things at 30 frames per second. I see things um, like these two brothers here, I don't see it like they see it. I see it in my own way. Mm -hmm. So like that night on, on, in the streets, I knew people will, will resonate to what I'm saying and what I'm doing 
if I package it, up, package it up as a story. So I speak, that's all I know. And I think that, and I know that, um, the, the, the premise of DETV is to tell these stories. Tell these stories, and we and 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 when I when I came up with the idea of DETV, it was to bring people together, find the human in people, based on their stories. And it is so easy easy to be prejudiced against someone if we don't know what they've been through. So what we do here is we try and we, we do social experiments and we've been doing them for years. I had a thing called Coffee with Strangers that we did and what it did was we had down at Starbucks that four people met and they never met each other in life. One was a police officer um, who was about to retire, his friend now, the Spanish girl, and they sat there and they were just trading stories. And how we did it was we wrote down like 20 questions and they had to ask each other questions. And then I remember one of them, one of the uh, participants was a Marine, uh, was a Marine. And the other girl uh, just graduated from college. And the question was, what thing changed your life? And he was telling us how he got charged for rape and he didn't do it. The girl, it resonated with the girl because her father got charged for rape and he, and he didn't do it. So with that, you have two different people that look totally different that now can combine, now, now find this trait, this something that they can connect to and now they understand each other and their friends to the day. I think and I believe that if we can just put everything aside and just sit and, and like I never, as long as I've known you, LH, I never heard that story. I never heard a story like that. So now I'm ready to ask more questions, ask me more questions. And that's how, the, that's, how, that's how we as humans do. We learn by asking questions, and we learn by, by listening to stories. As, like the old, the, 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 the and, you know, African culture, growing up, you know, you're listening to, you're, you sat at your grandmom's feet listening to her stories. So I, I, I know with media, in 30 seconds, I can tell you a story that will change the course and influence the behavior, your, your behavior. So what, we're, what I'm doing is I'm dedicated to make sure that we tell your story as a white woman, you know, Leon's story as a black man, um, Najee's story as a black woman, to find the common so now we can have, we can, we can paint a bigger mural on how Wilmington really, how, how I see it. And I see it as a melting pot of people coming together saying, yo, that's right, that's wrong. And I see it as people using their independent privileges that say, hey, I'm talking for you as a white woman saying, yo, on, on, on the behalf of my black brother, that's wrong. Because I understand his story. His story is just like my mother. True. I don't understand at all, but I understand enough to say that's wrong. So that's where I'm at with it. Eugene. Yeah, I, um, when I think of, in particular, I haven't touched on an idea, and you brought up earlier just the idea of stories. Um, what I'd like for us to all think about is, what is going to be the story that we say about ourselves 10, 15, 20 years from now? Where are we going to be? Um, in the history of all this. What side are we on? What position have we taken? What stance have we taken? What conversations have we had that have moved me? What conversations that we had that pushed us out of our comfort zone and pushed us in, in order to, to fight for something that, while it may not have seemed um, um, in line with the status quo, but it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think we have to, when we talk about stories, we also have to recognize, so we have to a, recognize our own, how we fit into this um, greater story or scheme of things, but we also have to understand the, the stories of individuals and how this is going to play a role. As far as I'm concerned, you know, 
and, and this is, I'm not saying this from a grim perspective, but I'm just being very honest about it. Um, what we saw on that night um, can easily happen again. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can very easily happen again. Um, and the realness of it is the fact that, uh, you know, we have, when we talk about even, you know, violence or, or, or just um, uh, incivility, um, many people within our community have been victims of this for so long that we have to understand their, their story of where this is, uh, this is coming from. And I think it's important for us to really take a step back and understand that story. And I'll, I'll give this um, quick point. You know, in 2050, 26, probably even sometime before that, maybe 2040, um, the United States will be majority minority country, right? Um, also, um, within that time, um, there was a Forbes magazine, I keep bringing it up everywhere I go, um, Forbes magazine, September 11th, 2017, was an article which said the median uh, wealth of the black uh, family will be zero by 2050. Mm. So, and our Latino brothers and sisters are around 2073, they're about 20 years later, right? So, when we speak of the stories that are going on right now, and we speak of the things that are going on, we have to talk about the fact that there are people that are struggling day in and day out to make it. They're being priced out of the wealthiest country in the world. And until we start really dealing with these issues, these stories that we see are going to bubble up to the top and we're gonna see this again. Because you can't have um, these constant reminders within community and constant stories that they're receiving that they may not matter, they don't matter, or their child's education doesn't matter, or um, the wealth of their family doesn't matter, and then not expect for them to show you, well, you know what, You're, these things, these symbols, or whatever the case may be, may not matter to us um, as well. So I think that we have to be very cognizant of that, and we need to start thinking about, that's why I go back to my first point, what are we gonna say about this time right now for ourselves? Are we gonna say that we were just marching and protesting? Or are we gonna say we were fighting for justice in the legislative mm -hmm. um, halls? We were fighting for justice in the boardrooms? We were fighting for justice in the police departments? We were fighting for justice in the education um, environments in which our children live? So we have to be very cognizant of that because if not, um, this will continue on. And I think that has to be a part of it. The you know, the benchmark, as, as Dr. West would say, the benchmark or a litmus test of success for me is not, you know, Eugene who wears a suit and tie, right? Um, or Ivan or Leon, it's not, it, we're, I don't think we're the benchmark and the litmus test of what is to be success. The true benchmark and the litmus test is, as um, my, um, my grandmother used to say, the least of the. How are we treating the least of these within our community, right? How are we treating those who are at the margins? And until we address those issues and, under, and truly take in those stories and truly become the heroes in our own stories and providing that um, and, and being of resource and being of service and actualizing on the things that need to be done, once we do that, then we will see um, this greater uh, mosaic of, of what can become. So Leon, we need to move from that perspective of fighting and victimhood through stories and when that starts even at the individual level, that changes the world. But how do you tell that to get to that ability to talk even if you were to, uh, Eugene, to talk to Ivan that discourse between the two of you, that dialogue, and remove that desperation for change right now, as opposed to investing for change in the future by understanding. You're a writer, you've told these stories. How do you position that so that other people can understand and start picking that up 
more than just talking at people? There are two points I want to make. Um, one has to do with education. Uh, it is, in my personal experience, as as an individual, and also watching my children, who are eight and nine, uh, go through the education system. Um, and it really, we talk about stories, it's really about history. And the fact that we're not telling the whole story <laughs> to our children. So they're growing up with this, uh, with this perspective that is skewed. So they're already coming out of the, out of the gate with a lack of understanding and a lack of knowledge with regards to what's really happening in this country. So I believe it is, it is imperative that we get serious about teaching our children what really happened in this country with regards to black people. There you will start, you'll, you'll begin to see and understand where the, the origins of where the anger comes from. You know, Martin Luther King, Benjamin Banneker, you know, my kids, that's what they're teaching in their school. There's way more than that. They're not teaching them about slavery. They're not teaching, they're not teaching them about what, what Nat Turner did, which, you know, is, is, can be viewed as, it was very gruesome, but it was a turning point in black history uh, for black people. Uh, so the, 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 the point about history is important because if we want to give our kids a chance and understand what's happening in this country and even in the world, we need to, we need to start telling them the truth. Uh, the other point I'd like to make has to do with the stories that we're telling today. From my perspective as, as a journalist, once a journalist, always a journalist, I was always, well, I want to say always, oftentimes I was the only black face in the room when we talked about stories. I was, I was determined to become an editor because when they had those meetings about what was going to go in the paper, what was going to go on the front page, what, how, was, how the stories were going to be portrayed, I needed to be that voice mm -hmm. to say, nah, we can't do this. <laughs> or, yeah, this is a great story. <clears throat> we should tell this story. How we're telling the stories today, and this kind of goes to Eugene's point about 15, 20 years from now, is going to determine in a, in a big way what the impression is going to be on young people in the future. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very, very careful today about how we tell these stories. Going back to the history, getting real about what happened in this country and telling our children the truth. And today, making sure that we tell stories about what's happening today that are real and that are, uh, that are complete. Because you can't just tell one side of a story and expect to call that the truth 15, 20 years from now. But here's the point. It's great to look down because, let's face it, there's a level of maturity between the three of you that a 20-something doesn't have, an 18-year-old doesn't have. When you're that young, you're living in the moment. Are you saying that it's education that is the cornerstone to try to get that perspective that will help in this civil discourse to grow? Or is there another couple of things that we should be considering. I, I, would, I would jump in real quick and just say um, yeah, one of my, my favorite leaders from the uh, civil rights movement was Ella Baker. And Ella Baker would say, um, you have strong people, you don't need strong leaders. Um, and I think that we have to, and, I, and I'm glad you pointed out the age bracket that you, you just did. Because when, even when you look at um, that civil rights movement, when, and I would say from the mid 50s to let's say mid 60s, many of the individuals at that time were in between that age bracket of 18 to 30, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so John Lewis at the time in that ballpark here was around 18 years old, still a teenager. Um, the re 
reason why I bring that up is we have to do a couple things. A, we have to um, we have to understand the fact that we have young people out here that can lead, but we need to make sure that they're trained. As I said earlier, strong people don't need strong leaders, so we need to make sure they're trained um, to properly advocate for themselves in their community. Um, we need to also uh, make sure that we're lending um, a true ear to their concerns, um, and we have to incorporate them in what is going on. And I think if we're able to, in putting those together, um, we can make sure that people are able to feel as though they're involved and engaged, because once someone feels like they're locked out, it, it, it creates a whole nother dynamic. Um, but if people feel as though they're actually being heard, and they're gonna do certain things that, it may, I'm 30, how old am I, 37 years old, so there's younger guys right now that are, or, there's, we have young organizers right now within our community um, that are 10, 15 years younger than I am. Um, I am here as a voice to, to, to answer questions or here to lend my ear, answer questions, provide any thoughts, counsel that they may have, but also recognize the fact that um, they are in a moment where they want, I have to trust the fact that of just them being involved and engaged is a beautiful thing in itself and helping them to channel that. Um, but overall, we just need to make sure that they're, as you said, educated, understand the tactics of organizing, understand how to get their point across, um, understand how to connect with people, um, and then believe in the fact that you know these people are the ones that are fighting essentially for the younger you get, they're fighting for more for their future, um, and essentially for ours. And so understanding that we have, um, we have something to do with, you know, the things that they do are gonna impact us as well, and understand how we can work together in order to make that change um, for all of us, because it's gonna impact all of us, whether it's us or our kids, grandkids, so on and so forth. So to wrap this up, what I hear you saying is that it's a combination of things. It always is. It's not one silver bullet for one thing. Um, but if I hear you correctly, education. If I hear you correctly, it's being educated enough to tell a story. And from what I hear the two of you saying with Leon is perspective comes through when those three things come together. Anything else to add? You know, I think Eugene really said it uh, when he brought up John Lewis being 18 when he was in the, in the throes of the Civil Rights Movement. You know, we have we have some young people who, who who are really doing it. They get it. So, to answer your question about, you know, does does the age matter? No. If you are, if you know what's going on, if you have a healthy understanding of what's happening recognize that there's a problem and that you if you have the courage to stand up and do something about it in a way that is meaningful uh, your, your age does not matter and what what gives me hope is seeing uh, young people who are stepping up uh, and and then uh, and, and, and are leading the way because you know these are the leaders of tomorrow and I'm thrilled to know that there are young people who are willing and able and have the courage to, to take this thing head on. Because this is, this is a defining moment in our country's history. So defining that, the, and the stakes are so high. So we have to get this right. And I believe with the leadership that we have right now, the young people that are coming up, who are leading this movement, I think we got a chance. And I really believe that uh, we're gonna see our country change for the better. I'd like to thank you, Leon, and thank you, Ivan, and thank you, Eugene Young, for doing such a great conversation. This is what civil discourse is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.